Hello, in this example, I will discuss uh, creating a uh, 2D tailing stem using Plexus LE. So to begin with, I'm going to create a new model by hitting this button. I will label it 2D tailing stem. I will be using the groundwater module in 2D space with um, a steady state groundwater flow calculation in metric units using a time unit of seconds. And I will label this tailing stem 2D example. Hit OK. Once I've uh, defined my model properties, I'll be greeted with a window that should show me a 2D Cartesian space. That's what's happening right now. So the first thing I want to do is um, generate my geometry. Um, using Plaxis, you can either manually draw the polygons that uh, will be used to define the soils, or you can import uh, the geometry uh, from a third-party program. In this example, we have um, a geometry already generated through a DWG file. So I will need to go there. So I'm going to go to import ESRI shapefile. And I need to select the path. And then um, for this example, we've already have a shapefile generated. Um, if you're using um, Plexus LE, it's uh, included in the software package under the tutorials directory. So I'll hit open. I can see here that the directory is correct. Then I'll hit next. You can see here that the, uh, the window prompt is telling us that nine shapes have been recognized from the file. Uh, to import all the shapes, I'll need to highlight them. So I'm going to select the first one. Scroll down, hold down shift, and that will highlight the nine regions I want to import. Once those regions are highlighted, I'll select the import selected objects um, button. And then it tells me nine regions have been imported, which is the number in the window. Great. So, okay, so our 2D cross section has been generated. I feel pretty good about it. So now I will want to inspect the region properties. And indeed, this looks good. Um, so we can see that we've uh, generated these regions. And indeed, um, once the regions have been imported, let, we should give them names. This will assist us at a later time when we're defining the material um, definitions. So I will just go down the list. I'm using the tab button to uh, move between the cells. Great, so now that's uh, complete. I have names for each of the polygons. Now I need to generate the materials. To do that, I will go to the materials manager. I'll create a new one. Uh, the first material I want to define is the earth fill. This is an unsaturated material. I'll hit OK. So we need, uh, for the steady state calculation, First of all, to define the volumetric water content properties and the suction curve that's generated from variability in uh, water content. 
And we also need to define the hydraulic conductivity of the soil. Now, um, soils can be defined as isotropic or anisotropic. Uh, the difference is that um, in anisotropic materials, you have variability depending on the plane of orientation that you're inspecting the uh, hydraulic conductivity. So it's possible to have uh, certain planes where water has more resistance uh, versus uh, other planes of orientation. With an isotropic material, depending on all um, planes of orientation, the conductivity remains constant. So you could think of it like there's uniformity in the soil. Um, so flow would be equally resisted um, through all uh, reference, uh, reference uh, geometries. So uh, first of all, I want to define the volumetric water content uh, for the earth fill. This example, it's point, uh, 0 0.368 with a specific gravity of 2.65. In this case, we'll be using uh, this method of curve fitting for the um, water curve. And the way this works is that there will be different magnitudes of suction depending on the volumetric water content. And how this works is that um, capillary forces will develop in a partially saturated soil such that the surface tension of water will create stresses inside the soil volume. And this will be variable depending on the um, magnitude of water content of a given soil volume. So because we're working in metric units, the suction value will be in units of stress in uh, pascals, uh, specifically kilopascals. So I'm just going to input the um, suction curve for various um, inputs of uh, volumetric water content. Okay. Additionally, we need to apply the fit. So I'm going to hit this button. And then I'm going to inspect the water retention curve, which shows uh, soil suction as a function of volumetric water content. From that um, uh, graph, uh, we can generate coefficients for our um, groundwater flow parameters. Now I need to define the hydraulic conductivity. Um, as I mentioned, um, this material is assumed as an isotropically uh, conductive material, which means that for all uh, planes of orientation, the uh, conductivity would remain a constant value. So for this uh, specific soil, the hydraulic conductivity is 1 times 10 to the minus 7 um, meters per second. We can use scientific notation um, in the program. So I'll do that, and we'll use a modified Campbell uh, permeability method um, to estimate the uh, K minimum and the P. Uh, we can, there's in, uh, data sets that are already defined for different soil types. So we can refer to the USCS classification for the soil type. Select that soil type in the window, and then that will automatically generate parameters for that given uh, soil gradation. So in this case, it's sandy loam. And then we can define a K minimum of 1 times 10 to the minus 9. Great.
Um, I will need to do this for the remaining uh, eight polygons. So we'll create a new one. We'll call it filter sim. The core clay is um, unsaturated, so we will need to develop uh, retention curves for the core clay. Um, in this case, we'll do use the manual uh, manual parameter entry option. Additionally, I need to apply the fit and inspect the water retention curve. And we're assuming that, um, again, the hydraulic connectivity is constant. That looks good. Great. So now I need to define the remaining swirls. We have a sandy loam with a volumetric water content of 0.4, a specific gravity of 2.65, with a constant hydraulic connectivity of 8 times 10 to the minus 9 meters per second. And I'm just manually inputting the different um, soil types and um, groundwater parameters for each soil. And then finally, we have bedrock. You would expect bedrock would have a very low hydraulic connectivity because we would not expect um, that much flow to occur through bedrock. And we have, indeed, it's quite small, 1 times 10 to the minus 10 meters per second. So we would expect most of the flow to occur through the high connectivity materials. So relatively speaking, we expect the filtered sand to have the most flow um, in this data set. OK, so now that our materials are defined, I'm going to hit OK. I'm going to go to the model and then make sure that everything looks good as far as the, the geometry that um, is visible, that everything has been correctly defined. So I'm just going to cycle through the different options here. 
Indeed, everything looks good. So now I need to go to the stage settings and um, input the um, materials for my different uh, regions. So this should be a sandy silt. This should be the sandy loam. This should be the earth pill. This should be the silt. This should be the, uh, I'm sorry, that should be the filter sand. This should be the ore tailings. This should be the clay core. This should be sandy silt. And this should be the bedrock. And then we can see that um, each of the soils we've defined have been correctly inputted into our model. Okay, so because we're doing a steady state 2D uh, model, the next step is for us to define the uh, groundwater flow boundary conditions. Um, we know that from Darcy's law that um, a hydraulic gradient is necessary to drive a steady state solution. So we need a differential in um, hydraulic gradient to mobilize flow in the model. So to generate our groundwater flow boundary conditions, I'm going to hit this icon here, uh, the line segment section. And I'm going to want flow to be um, moving from the left side of the model to the right side of the model. So I'm going to uh, assign a high value, a high uh, groundwater flow boundary head on the left side and a smaller one on the right. That will create a hydraulic gradient, which um, flow can, um, a steady state solution can be derived from that hydraulic gradient. Uh, input. So, um, so now to do that, I'm going to highlight my regions where I want to define a boundary condition. I'm going to hit the option, create and assign a new boundary condition. A new window will pop up. And then I'm going to give it a total head value of 130. Here. And then I'm going to do that for the remainder of the uh, boundary conditions on the left side of the model, so the X Men boundary. I'm going to repeat this process. We have different ways of defining groundwater flow boundary conditions in Plaxis LE. Um, I'm using total head, but um, there's you may use pressure head as well. You may have regions of no flow. Um, you have a lot of uh, customization as to how you want to build your model. In this example, I'm just going to be using a total head. And flow will occur from the left side to the right side of the model. Okay, so now all regions on the um, X min boundary have a total head of 130. I'm going to also set a boundary condition on the surface on the left side of the uh, dam. I'm also going to give that a total head value of 130. and on this uh, left-hand side of the dam itself. That will also be 130. Great. And then on the right side, so we, would, we have this region of high head here. And then on the right side, we're gonna have a region of low head. So I'm going to create a new boundary condition right at the seam of um, high conductive material, create and assign a new boundary condition. I will give it a total head value of 92 meters. Okay, after adding that region of um, a groundwater flow boundary of 92 meters, I can speed up the process by simply highlighting the line and telling the program to set the boundary condition seven, which is the one I've just defined. 
So now I'm not creating a new boundary condition. I'm just using an existing one that I've already defined in the model. And so I've inputted my groundwater flow boundary condition. So you can see here that flow will be mobilized from the left side of the model to the right side of the model using a steady state calculation. Okay, um, now we're going to um, create a flux region. So I'm going to go to flux section and I'm going to create a new flux section. Um, this will be defined as a line. And I'm going to input the coordinates here. Hit OK. Great. So we've generated the model, we have our boundary conditions, and we have our soil properties. Uh, the next step uh, to um, run the steady state model would be to generate the mesh. The mesh is the um, uh, where the calculation actually takes place within a finite element framework. Uh, we need to define the element geometry uh, so the program knows specifically how fine or how coarse the elements need to be in the given model. A coarser mesh um, will usually lend itself to a faster calculation because there's less data points in the actual uh, PDEs to solve, whereas a very fine mesh will have lots of data points, a larger matrix to solve, and may take longer. Uh, but because the number of data points has increased, you would expect a more accurate result. Um, in this case, I have a predefined um, mesh parameters I'm going to use. So I'm going to say that the maximum edge length will be 2.5 meters. Uh, because we're using triangles, I want to um, specify the interior angle of that triangle. And then I'm going to have these other options. So I'm going to hit generate. And then we can see that a lot of elements have been generated in this model here. So these are all triangles. It looks like a, a fairly uh, fine mesh. So once we, we've, um, we've constructed our model, we've constructed our geometry, we've, we've defined our uh, soil parameters and our groundwater flow boundary conditions, we have all the input needed to run a steady state solution for this cross section. So to do that, I'm going to go to solve, analyze. I'm going to save and continue the model. And then it's going to run. Once the calculation is finished, we can go to the output by clicking on the icon on the left side of the toolbar. Uh, we can see here that we've generated a flux um, for the defined uh, output, and we can see the pore water pressure distribution along the dam itself. Um, as we would expect, we would um, anticipate uh, lower pressures to develop on the downstream region whereas the upstream region has higher pressures. This is facilitating the hydraulic gradient. Uh, we also have suction that develops um, on the downstream side of the dam. Uh, this is due to the suction curves we've defined earlier. We can cycle through the output by going to um, the toolbar, going to contours and uh, manipulating the view settings. So right now we're uh, visualizing the poor water pressure distribution in the model. We can also look at the total head that's generated. And then I can hit OK. And then we can see the um, uh, contours of total head. Um, as we would expect, uh, high head, total head develops on the uh, upstream side and then slowly decreases as we go downstream. From here, we would get a hydraulic gradient, which is um, mobilizing the steady state flow. Um, and then that concludes the um, tailings dam presentation.